suppose that's the show then. Uh, I, I know not what I did to, to acquire such uh, exuberant applause, but I thank you for it, friends. How are you faring today? Oh, come. We must enter into this confab with the greatest of exuberance, yes? Yes. Uh, we uh, uh, we should uh, ideally enter into this conversation, this confab, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as exuberant as we enter into this new American experiment, yes? Yes. So uh, I say again to you, good day, friends. Good day. You have no complaints. You must not be Virginian. If not from Virginia, where from, friends? Jersey. The Ohio, welcome from Terra Incognita. Georgia, welcome. Uh, you relate to the colonial party, but we, we're glad you made it. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, the land of religious anarchy. <laughs> Kansas, never heard of it. Florida, Spanish country, welcome. You escaped. Oklahoma, uh, here I call myself a savage of the West because I live so far to the West. I live on the edge of known territory. I call myself a savage of the West. I say out of my back door is a great ocean, an ocean of green. But I think perhaps you from Kansas and Oklahoma, um, you outpace me on that front, yes? Uh, I shall make you the same uh, um, offer that I make many men who are traveling out west. My father was a great explorer. He was a, a, a cartographer, a surveyor, a map maker. Uh, and he traveled uh, extensively uh, out west as well. I'll make you the same offer that I make many men traveling out west. And that is, um, find me a mammoth elephant alive, and I will uh, pay you for it. Yes? Deal? Deal. Extinct, says uh, our dear friend of, of the age of what? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's I believe, I'm not, I'm not alone in this. We believe that they're alive. We found their teeth, we found their bones. Yes? That's why they're dead. Well, yes, those are dead. But... <laughs> Can't outsmart these two. But the, uh, so our thinking is at this time that why would our creator create a, a species and animals uh, just to allow them to become extinct? Uh, so we perhaps think that maybe they migrated to the west. And so I wish to find one, and I wish to find one for one specific reason. And it seems that you are well read. Can you read? Yes. There's a there's a gentleman in France named Buffon, George of the College Buffon, and he's a he's a naturalist. He's a, perhaps the world's greatest naturalist. Uh, he's a scientist, and, and what he says is taken as golden fact, right? He says that American wildlife is inferior to European wildlife. He says that because of our climate, they cannot grow to the great size that we see in Europe and Africa. So, I wish by one example to refute this claim, and that is to find a mammoth elephant, or as I call them, the incognita, or the mastodon. I wish to find one alive, put it on a boat, and ship it to France. He's correct? No, no, no. We have a, we have a, I don't think so. Uh, friends, uh, uh, I had a, a, a request to speak on, on something domestic uh, as, as we begin this conversation. And then I wish to turn the conversation over to you uh, as this uh, now country is, is in your hands. So too should this conversation be. Uh, so I shall move from, from natural philosophy to, uh, uh, to something quite ho close to home, to uh, domestic uh, uh, bliss uh, and harmony and then uh, perhaps uh, touch upon some systems of rights and law before turning the conversation over to you. Is this amenable to you? Yes. I came to this city, again, what, what great exuberance. I came to this city at 17 years old. As I said, I lived so far to the west, I did not have uh, uh, this deep understanding of, of uh, well, a cosmopolitan city of this size. We did not have such out west. I'd never seen a three-story building made of brick. Um, uh, this being the capital, this has uh, uh, the great center of, of mind, of thought. Fourteen taverns in this city, and one church. Um, I came here at 17. Do you know why I came here? To study, yes, where? At William and Mary, the old Royal College of King William and his wife Mary. Round of applause for the friends in the front row. I attended uh, that institution for two years. I received no degree, and then I moved back in with my mother, <laughs> which I hear is now an American tradition. <laughs> After 
leaving that institution, I fell in with a man who taught me law. Do you know his name? George Wick. His home is just on Palace Street. You can go inside. When you go inside, look down at your feet. It might seem boring, but look, look at the floorboards that you're standing on, because you will be standing on the exact same floorboards that I walked on when I was reading law under Mr. George Wick. Uh, Mr. Wiss, I say, is my friend in my youth and my mentor in my entire life. He has been a great teacher to me, not just in law, but in natural philosophy, the science of botany, zoology, chemistry, astronomy, and medicine, language, music, art, architecture, culture. He's a man of the enlightenment, Mr. Wick. Uh, during this time, when I was 17 to 19, um, I, after coming to the city, I, I I, I paid a series of uh, uh, tickets and subscriptions to Ball, wherein I hope that you might meet someone of the fair sex at one of these balls, yes? And I did. Her name was Rebecca Burrow. Um, I made proposal to her, in fact, I, uh, at the Raleigh Tavern. You know where the Raleigh is? Just down the street. I made proposal to Miss Rebecca Burrow. She has a, a deep, a long family in Virginia, very proud family, prominent family. Uh, and I saw her, I walked into the room, and there she was, standing at, next to the fireplace, mm -hmm. evening light across her cheek like damage. So, I approached her, and then I don't know what happened. I say that my sentences began where they should have ended. They ended where they should have begun. My sentences had more stops than starts. It was a total disaster. But I am Mr. Jefferson, I am persistent. I had, a, a, as I mentioned, a series of subscriptions to a series of balls, and I knew that she was to be in attendance at about two months' time, another ball, not in this city, just one county over. And so I, I steeled my mind in the interim. I chose my words carefully. And it's not, it's not said of me that I am a great speaker. It's said of me, in fact, that I'm not a great speaker, that I have a bit of a stutter that I, I cannot commonly string three sentences together. So that two months became quite important, because I planned, yes? I chose my words, perhaps I practiced in front of the looking glass. The next ball, open the door, there she is. I took a breath. Then I went for a glass of wine. That was either a wise choice or a mistake. And then I approached her. How many of you are married? Those of you who are married, perhaps you can tell me where this one went wrong. I approached Miss Burrell. I said, good evening, Miss Burrell. Uh, I have a very important question for you. I will not ask it now, but I do wish you to think on this question that I have not yet asked. Uh, but you have plenty of time to think upon this question because I'm going away to Europe for a year. But when I come back in one year's time from Europe, I expect an answer to this question. Good evening, Miss Burke. <laughs> what went wrong? Uh, apparently, I did not ask the question. She married my best friend a year later. I told you this was a delightful story. The chief agrees. <laughs> Out of that, it's Mr. Henry again. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, uh, I, uh, my mouth failed me twice. And what do they say about the third time? And I was. This third time, not proposing to Miss Burrell, but rather to uh, Martha, who had been widowed. Uh, she had a husband prior to me, Martha Wales uh, Skelton as for her first marriage. Uh, Dr. Skelton passing away quite suddenly. She found herself a widow, and her father was one of my clients as an attorney. I was representing him on some land speculation cases, some friendly caveats, or so it's called. It's a, it's a way for people to avoid paying taxes. We attorneys have been doing the same thing for generations. And I was representing John Wales, and, uh, and so I started making a few more house calls. And at one moment, I heard her playing her, her harpsichord, and uh, I, I accompanied her on my violin. You see, the third time I had learned my lesson, I did not let my mouth do the talking or the wooing. I let my violin do the, do the work. Yes? 
we commune first over music, um, and since we had married. Friends, uh, before I turn the conversation over to you, I wish to, to say uh, uh, a few things. First and foremost, this government is now yours. This is a radical thing. We, the radical nature of 76 is not that we declared independence. The radical nature of 76 is not that we, we, we engaged in bloodshed or war. The radical nature of 76 is not that we took the crown off of one man's head. What is radical and audacious about 1776 is that after taking the crown off of one man's head, we turned right round and placed that crown upon all men. <coughs> this is radical. How many governments do you think are doing this at this moment? How many governments might be doing this in, oh, I don't know, let's say hypothetically 246 years? <laughs> This is the radical nature of 76. We are turning the entire power of government over to we, the. What a beautiful, radical, audacious, stupid idea. Yes? Surely you will not muck it up. Now, when I say all men, do we mean all men? Why do you shake your head? How old are you? Ten. Can I ask your name? Say again. Lorraine. Lorraine. Ten-year-old Lorraine said uh, there, there are black people who have been enslaved by us, and we have taken away their rights, and thus all men perhaps does not mean all men. Out of the mouth of babes comes truth. Yes? Round of applause for young Lorraine. You're quite wise. You know, there are some, some people my age and older who refuse to talk about this. Yes? If you find yourself in a relationship and you wish your relationship to be better with your partner, then you talk, right? You don't just push things under a rug and hope that they will get better, right? The only way through a, a, through a, a difficulty in your personal relationships is through conversation, through open, honest conversation. So why should we expect anything different in this country? This country that is now led through debate through a large committee. If we wish to be better, then we must talk of these things. These things that I inherited. This institution that we all inherit. If we wish to be better, then we must engage with one another to be better. We cannot just theorize that we'll be better. We must act. Aristotle says that action. Is, is the true mark of a man, not, not the philosophy. You can say good words, but what is your action? So this is our action, Lorraine. We currently have slaves, or as you said, enslaved. I like that. But I say slaves, and so do my peers, and so I shall stick to primary source if that's what you're all paying to see today, yes? <laughs> These slaves are property. By law, they do not have the same systems of rights that we might guarantee for ourselves. Is this, is this justice? Is this equity? So when we say all men in the Declaration, we have yet to see it appear in law, right? The Declaration is not law, it's not a constitution, it's not binding for Virginia to create something, it's not binding for Georgia to create something, it doesn't create a system of laws and rights for we the people at large, it does not free great swaths of men. It is a theoretical document, it is, a, it is a, an aspirational document. It's an idyllic document. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, so said I, I believe Dr. Franklin said it's self-evident, I don't know, I guess it will stick. <laughs> we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men are created equal, that we are endowed with certain inalienable rights. We don't see that in law, not yet. So whose job is it, Lorraine, to ensure that this document does not just sit in a beautiful, idyllic setting, but actually through the ideals of Aristotle, through action, whose job is it to create the action to be better? You know? The people. The people who now run this government, yes? These aspirations are there before us. Now it's up to us to do better, to be better, to fulfill this promise rather than deny and defer. Yes? I could have said all white men are created equal. I wrote the thing. 
Do you think there are any Negroes voting on this Declaration of Independence? I could have said states. When I say all men, my hope is that someday we might fulfill this aspiration. We aren't there yet. But maybe we'll get there if people like Lorraine, well, you have to wait 170 years to get the vote, huh? Sometime, Lorraine, sometime. Friends, in the last uh, moments we have, I wish to turn the conversation over to you. And so in proper parliamentary procedure, the gentleman will pose a motion to see the remainder of his time to the people. Is there a second for this motion? Has been so seconded, it's now before the floor for a vote. All in favor, aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Who said nay? <laughs> Be bold, raise your hand. Who said nay? Ah, uh, I see. Being quiet. Well, we thank you for saying nay. Let us not forget this entire country was founded upon men who stood up and said nay. Let us not forget this entire country was founded upon dissent. Yes, upon protests and sometimes even bloodshed. Let us not forget this. Where else is man more free to stand up and say nay to his own government than upon this soil? So we thank you for being an example, because when we're all thinking the same thing, someone's not thinking, so we thank you for doing all the thinking for us. That being said, we find ourselves in a democracy, so your vote has been counted by the clerk of the court, but you're in the minority, so you'll have to uh, do better next year. <laughs> what questions do you have? Raise your hand, yes. Sure. So the lady uh, from the state of Ohio, Ohio the Ohio Territory, is, is inquiring not just upon uh, religion, but upon philosophy. The works of Hume, the works of Locke, John Locke, who if you, if you have read or heard of the Declaration, then you know Locke very well, do you not? That all men are created equal. We are endowed with a certain right. Life, liberty, and Locke would say the pursuit and acquisition of property, right? I like happy. Um, so, I, I, I stole that, you know. I, I, I'm an attorney. I get paid to steal. We call it precedent. Uh, the lady is inquiring. I'm going to put my joke in for myself. <laughs> but I like it. I'm going to use that again. Uh, the lady is inquiring as to the influences of Locke upon religion, and perhaps even the, the existence of miracles, is that right? And, and what we might think of upon miracles. Well, you, are, you asking, are you asking because of a certain Bible? Ah, I see, I see where you're going. Uh, sh the lady's been pilfering through my nightstand. Uh, there's only one copy of that Bible. Um, the lady is, in is inquiring if I might be so bold as to a, 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 a book that is in my nightstand called The Morals and Teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. It's not called Jefferson's Bible. Please uh, uh, dash that away if you, if you Year of Jefferson's Bible, uh, a pushback on that and say, no, 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 it's a very simple title, you'll all remember it, there will be a quiz after this, The Morals and Teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, yes? yes? The Morals and Teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, it's bound in red letters, stamped with gold upon the front of it, with those letters, it would be blasphemous for me to call it a Bible, right? Yes. We must have nothing Darians in front of us, <laughs> atheists. It would be blasphemous to call it a Bible, yes? Yes. I did not create a Bible, right? Yes. I did not create a book called Jefferson's Bible, right? right. Good. Let's start there. Secondly, uh, the lady who has been filtering, I mean no offense, but there's only one copy. It's not meant for, 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 for um, a dispersion amongst people. It's not meant for sale. I believe that if you could, I believe that if I could come back in 246 years, hypothetically in the year 2021, and see on Amazon.com that you could buy a book called Jefferson's Bible for $19, I would happily go back to my grave again. It's a private Bible study. And if you've ever engaged in Bible study, then, then you ask yourself deep questions. You question the validity, right? You question the source, yes? You question what did he mean? What did they mean, right? 
Isn't this Bible study? Yes? Yes. I had a lady who was sitting just there on the grassy mezzanine about eight months ago say, I heard you cut up the Bible, and I said, no, 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 no. That is false. That is false. I did not cut up a Bible. I cut up eight Bibles, man. <laughs> was the Bible first written in English? Might things be lost in, what's it called? Ah, oh, yes, you know. Things might be lost in translation, yes? Have you read the Bible? I'm sorry, let's back up. Have you read the Bible? You know there's more than one, right? You know there are some books and some Bibles that do not exist in other Bibles, right? Doesn't this make you curious? You know that, that even within one Bible there are accounts and books that do not agree with one another? Does this make you curious? It certainly made me curious, and thus my Bible study. It's not called Jefferson's Bible, but rather... <laughs> so I, I created, uh, I, I used two sieves basically, I worked as an historian, and I used two sieves. The first sieve is that the, uh, the, the, whatever is said of, of Jesus, the morals and teachings of Jesus, whatever, whatever is said of him, what he did, uh, must be as close to primary source as possible. I'm working as, as an historian there. Um, so someone ideally heard him do this thing or saw him do this thing. And secondly, the, uh, these accounts must agree with one another. If it makes it past those two sieves, then quite literally it makes the cut. And it gets removed from eight Bibles. Uh, but the Bible was not first written in English, and we know things might be lost in translation. So in, in a blank book, I pasted those... Uh, those English uh, phrases of first-hand accounts that agree with one another on the left-hand side of a page. If you open up, open up to, to any page, you'll see two in front of you, the left page and the right page, and the left-hand column of the left page is that phrase in English. Uh, to the right, closer to the, the fold, is that same phrase in French, going back in time. Going back in time again on the opposite page next to the fold is that same phrase in Latin and finally in Greek, so that I can make the translation of a first-hand account that agree with one another from Greek to Latin to French to English, and thus the cover, as it says, the morals and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Does this make sense? Stop pilfering. <laughs> and please do not buy a book called Jefferson's Bible. There are properly named books out there if you wish this copy, although it was not meant for, for dispersal, but, uh, but you can buy the correct version, and I believe I would yeah, I don't want the words in my mind, but at least that's better. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Thank you for it. What else? That's a very long answer. I can give short answers occasionally, yes. I had heard that there was a, a bet going on between you and the, your cousin, the Attorney General, Randolph. Yes. I was curious as what this bet was about. Uh, the gentleman is inquiring as to uh, uh, a, a bet. Uh, uh, an arrangement between the Attorney General, Mr. Randolph, and myself. Uh, John Randolph? Yes. John Randolph is my cousin. I'm related to Randolph. My mother is a Randolph, Jane Randolph. And so when I, when I was born, I found myself related to half of Virginia already. Sometimes in Virginia at this time, our family trees are more like reeds, you know. Um, so... Yeah. So, uh, Mr. John Randolph, who lives just uh, just very close to here uh, in Caswell Hall, uh, is brother to Peyton Randolph. Peyton Randolph lives just there. Peyton Randolph was the first president of the Continental Congress. Both of these men are my first cousins. Peyton Randolph, in fact, had he lived one year longer, well, today you'd be saying, let us fix our Peyton Randolph rather than our John Hancock, right? Uh, he was elected unanimously, 75. Elected unanimously, 74. We figure he might be elected unanimously in 76, but he passed away. He had a brother, John Randolph. They had differences of opinion. Imagine that. Their differences of opinion were, uh, were upon, the, uh, upon this split, this divide in this country. Peyton Randolph found himself a patriot. John Randolph found himself a loyalist. Uh, John, Ra you thought your Thanksgiving were bad. John and Peyton did, uh, did disagree so heavily that John found it in his heart to remove himself and his entire family from this continent, go back to England. Well, except for one son who stayed, Edmund, and I quite like him. In fact, I turned my entire law case, uh, my entire docket, over to Edmund, some 260 some odd cases uh, when I gave up the practice. Uh, now, Mr. John Randolph and I have made an agreement. I like his violin. You can find this if you ask Dr. Google, 
can find this arrangement. It's in it's in the early section of the fifty thousand letters that you that you can read of, of mine. Um, this agreement was uh, me asking for his violin. <laughs> I said it's the finest violin in all of Virginia, and I quite like music. I like violins. I have some quite expensive violins of my own, but I really like John Randolph's. John said, uh, "No, over my dead body." I said, I'll trade you something for it. And he said, what? Uh, I, I said, books. I know you like books. I have a great number of books. Let's trade. He said, again, no, over my dead body. And I said, fine. Let's make an agreement. And he said, very good. So we agreed that whoever deceased, whoever survived the deceased, uh, if I survived, I would get his violin. If he survived, he would get 100 pounds sterling worth of, uh, worth of my books of his choosing. So when he found it in his heart to remove himself from this continent because of his political leanings. He might have considered himself somewhat dead to his friends because though he did not pass away when he left the continent, he left his violin behind with me. You know, I've never been asked that question before, so I'm happy that I had that knowledge in my head. <laughs> But it's a lovely agreement. You can, see, as, I, as I said, you can see it. It's it attested to. It's a legal document. We <laughs> now I'm remembering something else. I believe it was a bit of a jest because we have in that document um, uh, uh, the word the aforementioned probably 16 or 20 times. So I think we're. He's an attorney, as you mentioned. I was an attorney. I think we we're having a bit of fun. The aforementioned John Randolph. The aforementioned uh, uh, violin. The aforementioned 100 pounds sterling. The aforementioned. Thomas Jefferson, the <laughs> aforementioned above parties, the after, it's, it's, it's a bit silly. Uh, I think we were having a bit of fun, but it's attested to and witnessed by, uh, by men in the city, including Patrick Henry, uh, his signature is the They're upon the thing too. I thank you for one final curiosity and then we must be on our way, yes. Was I surprised when I got endorsed by Alexander Hamilton? You're speaking of the election of 1800, yes. Uh, do you know Mr. Hamilton? You do. You don't know him personally. Oh, good. Um, yes, I was surprised when, when Mr. Hamilton um, endorsed me. You know, you'll find this strange because we learn from history, right? We learn from our mistakes in history. You'll, so you'll find this certainly strange. At that moment, the election of 1800, Mr. Madison and I had created another party. The first time it's ever happened. There's only one party in this country, the Federalists, which is a great party for government. It's a terrible party for the people. So Madison and I create a second party, actually on a fishing trip on Lake George in upstate New York. You can't make this stuff up. History is better than fiction. Madison and I create a second party to stand in opposition to this, uh, this Federalist party. Um, the Federalists saw themselves losing power in, in the government. In state governments, they were losing. In, in federal government, they were losing. And, and so men, when they tend to lose power, sometimes they don't do it very gracefully, right? So this, this outgoing party losing power, the Federalists began to grit, to claw, and use minutia of law, stretching our Constitution in ways that it should not be stressed or stretched, uh, so that they can retain power. It went so far that when, that when there were two candidates, myself and Mr. Burr, at that time the Constitution did not say there was one ticket. It just happened to be that the highest number of votes got the president, the second highest got the vice president, right? I didn't choose Mr. Burr on my ticket. But certainly, I assure you, Mr. Adams did not choose me to be his vice president, right? Uh, Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr and I were two anti-federalists in this new party. We were part of the problem, says the old guard, right? And the old guard still had power, although they had lost so many seats. They, they, their terms were not yet over. So when they, they shook, South Carolina lost a memo, uh, something happened, South Carolina lost a memo, and so they, they did not throw away one of their votes for Burr. And thus, thus myself and Mr. Burr tied. It was not supposed to happen. Um, this also had never happened before. So when, when there is a tie in the election, where does it go? The House. The House. It goes to the House, not some judicial party looking at you, Florida. Yes? Not so long ago. It goes to a representative body that represents, in a ratio, the people themselves. It goes to the House. Now, the House was still Federalist. So now the House had an option 
to vote on two anti-federalist candidates, one of whom was sort of the poster child for anti-federalism, who happened to create the thing on a canoe in upstate New York, right? So what do you think they did? Obstructed justice in an election. Again, we learn from history, right? They obstructed justice such that they wished to take away the will of the people. They voted and they purposely tied the House did, so they could hold the thing up. An outgoing party, a lame duck president, holding up an election, holding the will of the people hostage so that they can engage in partisan politics and continue with their little claws this grip of the last infinitesimal speck of power that they have in the hopes that they can rise again to the summit, right? They vote and they tie, 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 they vote and they tell me when I get to 36. It even went up to the presidency. I asked Mr. John Adams, I write about this. I said, I have heard that the Federalists are are using this obstruction of justice. They're, they're using this system to purposely hold up an election so that they can put into place their own chosen president, a president pro tem, for example. And Mr. Adams says, well, you have the ability to stop it. And I said, how? He said, promise me that when you enter into the highest executive, I can get you the vote. Promise me when you enter into the highest executive, you will vote on Federalist policy not this anti-federalist business that you're engaging in. And I said, I cannot do this. And he said, fine, then things must take their course, end quote. So was I surprised to see this, this old opponent step in at the final hour? Absolutely. And Mr. Hamilton said, apparently, that he likes neither myself nor Burr, but at least I stand for something, and Burr stands for nothing but himself. And so Mr. Burr, at the 12th hour, came riding over that hill on his white horse, and I believe saved this country. Only kind thing I'll say about Mr. Burr today. I'm sorry, Mr. Hamilton, or Mr. Burr. Does this answer your question? Yes. Thank God we learned from history, yes? You've only heard it from Hamilton's point of view. Well, there's the problem we need to talk. <laughs> Friends, uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you for being advocates of education. Thank you for being advocates of history. History is the most powerful subject that man might study precisely because we might learn from the mistakes made generations prior. Yes? yes. Even if they sit in some dissonance with your normal opinions, right? Yes. It does not make them wrong simply because you sit in cognitive dissonance, right? Yes. We can learn from these mistakes. The powerful component of history is that we, we, we need not repeat the same mistakes made generations prior. We can step into terra incognita and make new mistakes. Right? Because man is perfect or imperfect. Imperfect. Man will make mistakes. I say it this way. Man cannot create a government that is better than mankind itself. It is impossible. So if we wish our government to be better, then who must be better? You must be better. Cannot expect change within the halls and seats of power unless we are that change, unless we rise, unless we read aspirational documents and not just hold them as beautiful systems of theory, but actually act upon them, right? When we protect our neighbor's rights, we protect our own. Thomas Jefferson. When we allow the destruction of our neighbor's rights, we allow the destruction of our own. You new kings in this fledgling country, it is your obligation to protect your neighbor's rights. Because if you allow the destruction of their rights, it may not be you today, but it will be you someday, right? right. Again, as an attorney, we call it precedent. Anytime you need a northern star, we will be here for you. Williamsburg will always have its gates open. Always. There will always be a Thomas Jefferson here. There will always be a Kate from the Rollins here. There will always be a Patrick Henry, unfortunately, but we have to take the good with the bad. <laughs> and we will be your northern star. Your waters will come clouded with falsehoods printed as facts by newsmen. Come here, and we, here at Williamsburg, speak facts. Facts, 365 days a year, and that is something this country could use a bit more of. Yes? Yeah. Does not mean these facts will always go down easy. Right? Right. We 
cannot argue the facts. So let's be better, and until we meet again, I remember your humble and most obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson.